Cool. So I think we are on the air now, which is very exciting. I'm joined here with uh, um, I'm joined here by Nicole Teacher. Now, Nicole, you are just one of the most incredible high schoolers I have ever met in my life. You're just such an inspiration. Um, I I was absolutely gobsmacked. I I met Nicole recently. We were at the Tribeca Disruptive Innovation Awards, and uh, Nicole won an award there because of her incredible research that she's done into HIV. So I. I've, you know, I've invited you onto the show to just talk to people about all of the, the wonderful discoveries you've made. Can we start off, just walk us through what exactly um, you've done in the field of HIV, just so that everyone gets on the same page. So, so what I've been doing in this field? Yeah, yeah, walk us through your discovery. All right, exactly. So I just, I first got involved in HIV research. Well, really it started on the microfluidic side. So I was reading a paper on microfluidic technology. And microfluidics is really just manipulating very, very small volumes of fluid on the micro scale. And at the same time, I was also reading a paper on HIV diagnosis. And really, I found a common thread between these two articles. I found in the microfluidics paper, it was talking about Paper. It also the talks seems to have cut out on that. my video. I'm not sure if she's cut out uh, elsewhere, so I'll just wait for her to reload. Um, but yeah, I, I even chatting to you already, Nicole, with the things, the, the phrases you're mentioning, microfluidic. I mean, this is when, when I was in high school. I think that I was, um, you know, listening to the Spice Girls and uh, going to pop concerts and probably chasing boys or you know, wasting my time on games. I don't, I don't even know. I just feel like you are just so far advanced, especially for your age. But even not, not even taking your age into account, what, what you're doing is tremendous and your sense of curiosity is just incredibly inspiring. So keep going. You were talking about um, reading lots of papers and suddenly you got interested in papers on HIV. Yes, I really all, I actually do read a lot of papers, um, the scientific literature, because I just, I find that so fascinating and it's mm -hmm. what I love to do. So yeah, I was, I was reading these two papers and I found that there was really a common link between both of them. So that was the real similarity that I exploited. I really think that translational medicine and interdisciplinary research of so finding the common connection between two fields is really where all the best innovations come forth. And when it comes to HIV diagnosis and even the HIV epidemic in general, we've really been stuck in pursuing either one path, one field or another path that sometimes we've lost sight of the inherent limitations posed by each approach. So I think that where I was coming from being so far removed from this entire realm of research, I was able to really see the bigger picture and try and make connections that might not be that obvious to someone who's really so narrowly focused on one field. It's, it's incredible. I um, I think that that everything you're, you're doing is just wonderful. I, I want to go into more detail about what exactly you've developed. So I've, I've read a lot about this, but please explain like in layman's terms to a viewer who may not know anything about um, AIDS or HIV, what exactly have you been developing? All right, so I've been working on the very first test that can actually look to see if you have any signs of acute viral HIV infection. And what acute viral infection really means is early diagnosis of the, of the disease when therapy is most effective and also the risk of transmission is highest. And I've taken this acute viral load test and I've implemented it onto this fully disposable microfluidic platform for all location analysis of HIV. And what this really allows us to do is to conduct point of care testing of the disease and provide results in a single patient visit. And this is really significant because it really alleviates the emotional and economic burden associated with having to come back to the lab two to four weeks post initial sampling to receive your results. So instead, patients come in 60 minutes later, they have either positive or negative results. If they're positive, they're put on therapy right away, which really significantly enhances life expectancy and drastically reduces the risk of transmission. And Naomi, I think you've been cut out, so I'll just try reloading the page very quickly. 
Okay, um, I can still hear you. I, I, what I love most about Nicole is that sometimes uh, when I talk to people, I'll ask them to explain things in layman's terms as if they're talking to a high schooler, as if they're you know really at, at a basic level and uh, so you're dealing with someone who really doesn't have any experience of this. And here is Nicole. Now, I'm not sure if you'll realize, but she's 16 years old and she's talking with all of these incredible uh, scientific knowledge. Now, Nicole, I would love to know your background background in science. I would love to know a little bit about how you became, you know, involved in this sort of study. This seems so far, you know, uh, beyond anything I was doing at high school. How did you first get involved with this? All right, so it really it started back in grade eight, I believe. That was when we did our very first science fair in school as mandatory. And I just, I did this very interesting psychology project, actually. And then I thought to myself, why not actually enter it into the regional science fair and just really see what other kids are doing, how I do compared to them. And at that regional science fair, I was really blown away. I saw all these kids who were spending weekends and weekdays after school working in these labs. And I thought, that's pretty much what I want to do in life as a career. And also, I wanted to do that right then. So the next year, I actually, I came up with this interesting physics project. And I went to this material science lab at um, a local university and asked, do you think I could maybe work with one of your researchers? And I actually, I was accepted into the lab, which is awesome. And then the following year, so Nicole is cut out, out in biology. Oh, there we go. Oh. You see me? Yeah. So uh, last year was when I first thought, why not try something in biology? So I actually, I um, came up with this idea. Like I mentioned, I was really just doing a lot of reading the scientific literature, coming up with new ideas, and the connection, like I mentioned, between HIV early diagnosis and microfluidic testing, which allows cheap disposal platforms at the point of care, linking them together. And that summer, I spent every single day almost just going through um, Wikipedia, Google, trying to search up all of these terms, find out what they meant. So I was really just trying to build a foundational knowledge base, um, also crafting my own project proposal at the same time. Once I'd really gone into got in a feel for the field, really. I actually started sending out emails to researchers in the Vancouver area, and I ended up getting one reply out of, I think, 25 or so that I actually sent out, and that was where I first began working on this project. That's that's awesome. I mean, what you've basically done is revolutionized how we can treat AIDS, uh, how we can treat HIV, because you are able to recognize so early on whether or not someone is infected and that has tremendous benefits now where do you see the most impact for this sort of discovery because i see that you know third world countries are just going to benefit tremendously for this can you can you talk walk us through that a little bit yes yeah, so a low resource setting so decentralized testing locations that are otherwise very hard to access when um in the general testing framework. So for example, my vision that I have right now is that we have a healthcare worker who is armed with both um, anti-HIV drugs, or so drugs that combat HIV infection, as well as this cheap, disposable, rapid diagnostic tool. They go out into decentralized testing locations, so STD clinics, neonatal clinics, hospitals, the like. They conduct testing, and what this means is really they sample a finger stick blood, so just a small drop of blood, put it on the device, twist it, and then 60 minutes later, you have either a positive or a negative result. And if the patient is HIV infected, and this is actually very important for neonates, so very young babies under the age of 18 months, if they are HIV infected, they're actually put on therapy right away, which has been shown to lead to drastically increased survival rates. In infants, it's up to fourfold increase in survival rates. Wow. Um so this is basically like a pregnancy test. You know, I, I know that before to test for, for HIV, you had to do extensive blood work, you get your, your blood taken. And as you mentioned, the, the rate of people going back to the doctors afterwards to get their results, is just so low that really these, these tests weren't helping a lot of people. And what you've done is created something so um, e economically viable that it can be translated even into the third world. This is, this is huge. I mean, uh, when do you foresee that this sort of a test will be available on a supermarket shelf? So really, there's a difference between implementing it in low resource settings and high income locations. So when you talk about the supermarket shelf, that really that means FDA approval, Health Canada approval, EU markings. So that is a bit of a longer process. 
And probably the disposable diagnostic tool that's available for consumer use will come probably a bit later, so 10, 15 years or so. But the real imme immediate application right now is actually low resource settings, like I mentioned. So right now I'm looking into working with um, WHO, so World Health Organization, getting pre-qualification for this tool, and then also partnering with one of the largest antiretroviral therapeutic drug manufacturers in low resource settings to implement this diagnostic device into the HIV drug dissemination platform they've already developed. So we can really readily take these tests and then disseminate them into low resource settings because in the end, they don't really require any more infrastructure than say a bottle of pills. So it can really be readily absorbed into the current drug dissemination platform available for all of these low resource settings. Right. And also, Naomi, I think you've cut out again, so I'll try reloading one, one more time. Okay. Um, what's fascinating for me about this is that this, um, this test is able to be readily implemented in the third world, and yet in a, a place where we have more resources, more wealth, um, you know, more, more knowledge uh, about these sorts of things because of, of the FDA, it actually isn't available to the consumer. Now, um, th there's a, a lot of contention there about the role of, of the FDA and, and the right to try and all of this. And um, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I mean something that uh, seems to work and is good enough for the third world and seems to be so important in, in drastically reducing the harmful effects of, of HIV and actually being able to treat it in the early stage. I, I would love for this to be available now. You know, if it can be available in the third world now, um, then it, it blows my mind that we have to wait 10, 15 years before it can, can come to a place like, like America or Canada, where you're from, Nicole. Um, I mean, do you see, what, what do you think of the FDA process? Is this something uh, um, that is, uh, is hindering the process or, or do you see that as a, as a good thing to make sure that the product is tested and, um, and uh, ready to be implemented? So you were cutting up quite a bit in the past while, so I think you were asking me about FDA approval and whether mm -hmm. it hinders the process or it really just makes sure that we have the optimal tools available. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. yeah I do think that um, it is a hindrance in some respects in that it often is difficult in the early developmental stages because A, it requires quite a bit of money to actually obtain FDA approval and B, you really have to get started in the process very early on because say you get to the end stage and you have this finished product but along the way you weren't really keeping track all of the records weren't really in line and that you didn't develop it with the end goal in mind which is to obtain FDA approval so oftentimes there are a lot of bottlenecks and many companies don't actually get to market because of large obstacles like FDA but this is why um, WHO has created certain programs like WHO pre-qualification, which really allows us to implement these sort of um, disposable diagnostic tools really readily into more low resource settings to actually bring the care and what's necessary immediately instead of having to go through all of these different steps. Right. No, I think that's, um, you, you're wise beyond your years and that <laughs> you can see um, uh, how all of this works. I, I know that that I've looked into right to try a lot and different drugs, which when you talk about the resources involved to get FDA approval, um, the costs involved as well. And, you know, certain companies definitely have uh, advantages in that respect. And there do seem to be barriers to entry. So it is good to see that a project that a high schooler has come up with actually um, is, is able to be followed through. And um, I'd like to backtrack a little bit and talk to you about when you were following up with researchers, when you were emailing them, what was the response when when uh, you finally got a response there? What did did this researcher actually say when he found out that that or she found out that you were a high schooler? Actually, what I think is more um, what I think is more interesting to talk about is actually the rejections, and it's it's something that is extremely common in the field of research. Even if you're, for example, postdoc or an undergrad or grad student, a lot of the times you will get rejections, and it, often it's not because your research isn't good enough or not interesting enough but it's simply because there are very limited resources available in all of these labs. And sometimes it's simply impossible for a professor to actually take on a new student in, in their lab, especially in my case, which was me proposing this idea that was completely beyond the scope of what they were doing in the lab and would require a lot of new materials, a lot of reagents being bought. So that's on the rejection side. On the acceptance side, um, 
really, it all just, um, I had this professor, Dr. Mark Brockman, he just said, sure, why don't we get together, have a talk, see um, sort of your plans for this, I, for this research. And really, yeah, we just sat down and got to talking. And he said the one thing that really stuck in his mind was how much I persevered. So I think that's the number one most important quality that can really be any asset of a high school student is just to be so dedicated and never take no for an answer. So keep emailing, email all those professors and take risk. And that's exactly what I did. You, I took a risk. I'm a really shy person. I don't um, do well with rejections or criticism, but I got a lot. And it was, it was a great learning process because it made me realize that I could never accomplish anything until I actually put myself out there. No, that's that's an incredible life lesson right there. And you're you're very fortunate that you've you've gone through this at such a, a young age. This is going to bode very well for you, I think, in in the future. Um, so I mean, you're talking about the science fair and all of the other students who are doing amazing things there. Mm. I do you think that this is I a new phenomenon? Up, so I'm actually just going to reload again. Okay, sure thing. So while, while Nicole's uh, there, I just wanted to let everyone know if they're watching that you can actually submit questions if you have any specific questions for Nicole. Uh, all you have to do is just go to the viewer question box, which is underneath the video there. Uh, you can type in any questions and then I can field those uh, to Nicole whenever she comes back. Um, she is back again. So uh, Nicole, you're based in Vancouver, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, but actually, That's I can right. my work down in California. Sorry? Oh, okay. Did, did you say something? Yes. Yeah, I actually, um, yeah, no, so no, no, I was very first year. I was working. Yeah. I, I was working at a local university the first year, but this research actually, um, as I kept developing and conducting proof of concept trials, I realized that, especially when it came to the implementation into the disposable platform, so the microfluidic side of things. I realized that I would need quite a varied array of resources and expertise. So actually, I went down and currently I work at Stanford. So I developed a consortium of three different labs. I have one HIV lab and two microfluidic labs. And I'm just really delegating research associates and project plans and getting a lot of people involved on this research. That's fantastic. Can you walk us through uh, some of the science involved in how the test actually works? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You cut out for a while. I was just asking, can you can you walk us through in, in detail how the test actually works, what it's actually detecting um, that, that is able to, to let people know whether or not they have early onset uh, HIV? So I just got the other test for HIV side of what you said, but I'll really just build on that by saying there are two main streams for HIV diagnosis. So you can either look at HIV antibodies, and HIV antibodies are only present in the bloodstream, for example, six weeks post-transmission in adults, and they actually aren't viable biomarkers for infants who are under 18 months of age. So although they have um, developed, like, for example, the OraQuick HIV test, these, these tests for antibodies have been, have been developed. They're available. They're very rapid, disposable, cheap. But the problem is that they can't actually perform very early diagnosis of HIV, which is a problem, especially when it comes to initiating therapy early on and really maximizing life expectancy. So when it comes to doing what I just mentioned, conducting early HIV diagnosis, we're forced to look only at HIV nucleic acids. So for example, DNA and RNA. And when it comes to looking at DNA and RNA, we're inherently bound by the fact that the current nucleic acid tests actually require a very complex lab-based instrumentation. So the current mm -hmm. testing paradigm looks something like a mother, for example, wants to see if her infant has HIV, comes to the clinic, they sample the child, they send off the blood sample to a very centralized lab. Two to four weeks or so later, they actually get the result. And the issue with this is that many mothers or many patients won't actually follow up and up to 90 percent of patients are actually lost to follow up and this current paradigm for nucleic acid testing is very expensive so costs around 400 or so dollars per test wow and how does uh how much does your um your test cost so my test will cost under five dollars oh my goodness I mean, how, how are you able to bring those prices down? Is it simply because it is a decentralized lab process and the, um, the equipment is, is cheaper and is that how it works? 
So the real, um, the real idea behind this research is the fact that the nucleic acid test I've de developed is actually independent of all external instrumentation. So normally in called a thermocycler, which really just makes sure um, it out ensures that the acid um, I see oh. that uh, uh, Tiru is, is chatting in the chat, so I might get back to those questions after. Please continue, uh, Nicole, I, I'm uh, talking about the, the costs. Was I, what part was I just talking about when I cut out? Uh, so you were, you were just saying that, I, 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 for me, it cut out right at the start. Um, I was asking about how you were able to bring down the costs. Yeah. So really what I've done is I've managed to create a test that eliminates all external instrumentation because regularly when we talk about these lab-based assays, A, they require highly skilled workers, so that costs quite a bit. And also they require something called a thermocycler, which is just a very large machine that allows the nucleic acid testing reaction to proceed. So the innovation with my research is the fact that I'm A, able to eliminate all user interventions. So I've developed this microfluidic cartridge that actually fully automates the process passively with no external in input needed. And also I've managed to um, make obsolete all need for external instrumentation because the process that I'm using right now is chemically based and not thermally based. So there's no need for a thermocycler. Wow. And so this is cut out once again, so I'll just reload the page. Okay, no worries. Um, one thing while Nicole's gone that I wanted to say is just remarking on the automation uh, process. So that that's a huge part of it. When you take out uh, human labor skills and um, uh, human error and all of those things, it, it does seem that automation just is making things more and more cheap and it's just a, a great direction for the future. It's very exciting to see uh, this happen in, in multiple different uh, fields. I recently did a, um, a piece with Reason TV where we talked about the robotics industry Industry and how that's revolutionizing um, so many different fields just by uh, finding ways to to bring down costs and bring down human error and all of those things it's it's incredibly exciting Nicole uh, what you're doing what what you created there um, I wanted to get to a question that Mark has asked um, uh, Mark has said how much will this process cost after factoring in the cost of going through FDA process do you have an estimation of that hmm. So really, I think that um, I'm not sure if you're talking about the cost of actually in terms of the company and the research and producing this and bringing it to scale or the final cost of the device. So first, I'll, st I'll start about talking the final cost of the device. And when I bring in that five dollar so estimate, that's really just based upon a materials cost and b reagents cost. So reagents are really just the different enzymes that have to go into the reaction to allow it to proceed and those costs around four or so dollars and especially once I've fully partnered with all of the companies that I'm currently in talks with, this will actually really substantially bring the cost down. So hopefully around even two or so dollars for reagents and the materials oh for goodness. the device at most one or so dollars because it's fully paper based. So there aren't actually any very expensive vital components that would cost a lot of money, plastic, et cetera. Now in terms of the company, the manufacturing process, and scaling up commercially. We are currently looking at getting some funding now. We're mostly, so I just received my first grant actually from the Coulter Foundation just um, to support the very early research and developmental stages. In terms of obtaining FDA approval, I've heard that it can cost upwards of 10 million or so dollars. But really, oh. I'm looking at that at a bit of, yeah, it's a lot of money. And um, I'm looking at getting that sort of money, generating that sort of revenue specifically from venture capitalists, investors, donors, but that will come at a bit of a later stage once we actually have a functioning prototype because we're still obviously in research and development and many things are being changed and tweaked right now as we speak. Right. I mean, that, that is huge. You're adding $10 million to the cost where you've just said that you're able to bring down the cost of the test to $2. I mean, that, that this is huge. I mean, what worries me most about that is that those costs, I mean, they will be given by venture capitalists who want to invest in this product, but in return, they'll want to see some returns for their money, uh, which means that, that 
all of the costs for the consumer will go up in turn, which means we'll no longer have a test that's $2 to implement. Um, it, it's going to take a long time before economies of scale can bring that cost back down. It, it's devastating. Do you think that those costs are going to translate over, uh, transfer over to people in the third world who will be using this? Um, yes, if it's the same the uh, company. Sorry, go, go ahead, so Nicole. There is the possibility, but I'm mostly looking at getting this sort of money from companies who it's in their best interest to actually implement this sort of tool. So, for example, antiretroviral therapeutic manufacturers, really this is a tool that would very readily be absorbed into their current drug dissemination platform and it's really in line with what they plan to do. So if we get funding from these sort of companies or from similar diagnostic testing companies who can support the FDA approval process, the actual manufacturing scale up, we can substantially bring the cost down and also it's the idea that there currently is no market competition. So even if prices were to be inflated a bit, this would really be the only product that's available for people to buy. So eventually, hopefully, the prices will be able to go down as we speak to, for example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, USAID, and then they could subsidize some of the costs because that's actually that's something that's already been going on. We've seen it, especially with a drug dissemination platforms in low resource settings. Um, we've had a lot of these corporations really channel money to those to bring the cost down of the drug as, as much as possible. Right, and that's incredibly smart of you that you're going after companies in whose best interest this, this um, uh, research uh, already lies. Um, I, I think that, I mean, I, I do worry about uh, FDA costs then transferring over to third world um, countries because, you know, they're, they're the people who need this really, really cheap uh, diagnostic tool and uh, you've developed it and it seems that because FDA is involved in oh, the United um, States. Cut out again, so I'll try reloading. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, it seems that like as far as I can see, um, FDA involvement just seems to be bringing up costs for, for the third world as well, which is, is um, I mean, it, it's it's really saddening to me to see that happen. Uh, they've created a tool that that works. They've done their research, and uh, it seems to be successful. And the fact that they will have to wait uh, before they can they can launch this is um, is is sad for me because I think so many people can benefit. Nicole, you've uh, you've done you've come up with some numbers on how many people will benefit from this and how many lives it will save. What what is the figure that you've come up with? Exactly. So right now, um, there are actually there are 700 new infant infections every single day. And I focus on infant infections because that's really where the largest um, market and the largest target is for infections every single day. I think upwards of 380,000 or so per year in 2010. Wow. And the main problem right now is that only 50% of so of all HIV exposed infants are actually entered into the, uh, the HIV diagnostic pathway. And the main reasons for this is the fact that there's a loss of communication between, for example, mothers and healthcare providers. So they don't really communicate the fact that they might have been exposed to HIV or the infant might have HIV. And simply the fact that it's extremely cost prohibitive to do universal screening of all infants. So if we were actually able to develop a test that's extremely cheap, and can be used at the patient of point of care, we could actually screen all infants as soon as they're born. So we'd be able to identify all signs of HIV infection. And then if we can initiate therapy immediately, we can actually significantly increase survival rates up to fourfold increase. Oh my goodness, that's, that's such a huge amount of people that you're able to help. How does it feel to be a high schooler and to already be saving you know, millions of people around the globe? That I, what, what you're doing is just tremendous. Is, do, do, does that realization, realization really sink in to you that you've done so much at such a young age? Well, we're not exactly at the stage that we're saving lives. We're on track to save lives eventually once we have a functioning prototype that's deployed. But no, definitely. I remember in the beginning, a lot of it was the fact that it was almost, it was a science fair project. It was research. And as I kept doing all of my reading of the literature, I came to understand that it's really it's so much more than that. It, it's a story to be told, really, when it comes to HIV diagnosis and even the HIV epidemic worldwide. And well, I love creative writing. That was actually um, my thing back um, in the elementary school. So. I thought that I wanted also to be a part of this story and to play my own role. So I think 
yeah, I, I feel as if I'm just, I'm so involved in this community now and it feels absolutely amazing and heartwarming. And beyond the satisfaction I get as a scientist to be doing all of this cool research, working in the lab, meeting all of these incredible researchers, there's also, of course, the human component and that, that I'm doing my part. And I, I have the sense of duty both to myself and to others to really um, maximize and fulfill all of the um, opportunities that are handed to me. So yes, it feels absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and what blows my mind again when you're talking about this is when you say that you have this background in creative writing as well. So it seems that you're just, you know, <laughs> you've got all of these talents. So I'm, I'm very excited to see what the, what the future holds to you. Um, we'll, we'll start to wrap up now. One thing that I do just want to touch on, um, just the, uh, for a pure interest side for me, like how do your, your friends and family feel about your involvement with this? What has the reaction been from your peers and also from, from your parents? So for my peers, actually, I go to a school where um, science fair is actually something that's quite respected. I mean, many kids are very interested in doing scientific research, which I think is absolutely amazing and it really makes me feel welcome. So I remember, I think last year, the very best um, memory I have is the fact that after I went to um, one of my science competitions, uh, in assembly actually, on stage, everyone started standing up for me and they started clapping. So that was the one moment when I realized that Everyone really loves me for what I do and they um, are grateful and almost proud in a way. So that's been absolutely fantastic. And also with the fact that since then I've had a lot of students actually approach me and ask, is there any way I could also be involved in some sort of research, whether it be bio research or physics or chem. And of course, I've been trying to help them as best as I can, trying to put them in touch with possible mentors at local universities. In terms of my family, I. I don't even know what to say. I mean, they've been here throughout the entire process. Neither of them have actually done research, or my parents neither have done research in their lives, but they've been so incredibly support supportive. They've been taking me to the lab, driving me every single day, and then waiting in the car for up to three hours while I conduct my experiments. And I'm oftentimes very, very late, and it's something that, of course, we fight a lot about in the moment, but when we really see all of the results and the cumulative some of my efforts, it's really all, it's all so worth it. Yeah. And actually, I, you've cut out once more, so I'm going to try reloading again. Yeah, no worries. I mean, I, I just to, to close up, I, I bet that they must be tremendously imp uh, proud and impressed to have such an incredible daughter who has done so much in such a short time. It's, it's inspirational. Uh, so many people, when I, when I saw Nicole at the Disruptive Innovation Awards at, at Tribeca Film Festival this year, um, she was, she was in a room filled with these incredible CEOs of giant organizations who are just, um, the movers and shakers of the world, who are just changing the way the world functions. And for her to be up there already at such a, a young age is, is incredible, uh, for me. So, Nicole, I just wanted to thank you you so much for um, for coming on on the program and and chatting about this. This is um, an inspirational story, and I, I feel that this is only the beginning of your journey. Um, just to finish up now, what what do the next couple of years look like to you? When when do you graduate high school? Uh, it's, it's crazy to say that. When does she graduate high school? <laughs> um, and you know, would you plan to go to a, a college to continue this research? Are there other um, fields you wanted to try out? What what is what does the future hold for you? So I'm graduating high school in summer of 2016 and then afterwards, of course, I'm going to be continuing with this research. So within the next four years, I believe that we'll have a prototype that's actually been implemented in low resource settings. So obtained eligible pre-qualification, actually going out conducting research use only trials. In the meantime, in initially, so by April of 2016, I expect to have a functioning prototype developed. And then from then to 2020, it's a lot of manufacturing and business relationships. Nicole has cut out. So then you uh, said so um, uh, to 2020, I got up to there and then, then you cut out for me. Up to 2020, it'll just be forming all of the right manufacturing and business relationships to really bring it to scale.
Wow. Well, all the best to you. You are doing such a, a, incredible uh, work here and I am I am incredibly impressed. I'm sure that all of the people who have watched you and all the people who will be seeing this video will be blown away by what you've done. So con huge congratulations to you and um, I wish you all the luck in the world. Uh, not that you need it because you're obviously incredibly intelligent and incredibly driven and uh, will probably receive success in, in, um, in, in buckets. And so well done with everything, Nicole, and thanks so much for, for chatting here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about my work, so any opportunity I get, I just, I seize it. Okay, thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much for, for joining tonight and for watching. Uh, this video will be available if you if you know anyone who, who's uh, interested in this, um, and I, I hope that you'll join next time as well. Thank you. Bye.